Bad news, listener. Your cover is compromised, and the angels are coming for you. Time to go loud or go home. You are plugged into God Complex, a story about Demon the Descent. Welcome to Chroniclers of Darkness, a narrative horror podcast set in the RPG New World of Darkness. Due to adult language and the violent nature of the stories told, this podcast is rated M for Mature, and we strongly encourage listener discretion. Episode 4, Sermon of Silicon. Suppose you know a universal truth. The kind of thought as old as humanity. The kind of thought that churns and chews your soul into a termite colony. The kind philosophers transfer generations of thought before ever coming up with no answer. Big questions like, is there a God? Yes. Yes, there is. Well, what do you do with that knowledge? Knowledge that God is both matter and antimatter and thinks that you don't matter. Knowledge that God has no face, no voice, no way of communicating with you, and no desire to either. The God machine has no plans for you until it does. People are just investments of plasma and thought, termites that may someday make a nice powdered protein substitute if they survive the winter. The God Machine influences the world through its infrastructure. Those sneakers that came out last year, the Jordan 1s with the fake metal cleats on the bottom, maybe storage, maybe transmitters, but anyone influenced by the God Machine, be they demon, angel, or stigmatic, would openly react when hearing the metal of those cleats striking the pavement below. Audio litmus test just a safety measure to protect an ongoing project beneath Herald Square. When you have this kind of detached, unlimited power, why bother with humans? Why hide from them? Why recruit them? Why think about them? The only logical theory is that angels take energy to design, create, and maintain. Humans just take... time. And if the God Machine is immortal and outside time itself, maybe it's us versus them. Demons versus humans. However, keep in mind that's your logic as a human. That makes sense to you. Cause and effect, like gravity. The God Machine exists outside of those rules and expectations. Hell, I've heard it regulates gravity like a dial. Ashley Burke is in a compromising position. She is sitting in the back row of an assembly in a building that is, structurally, 50% God Machine influence, and she doesn't feel any of it. What is happening at this zip recruitment farce that is so powerful it can deactivate infrastructure? She also recognizes something about the shape of the crowd in their seats. Every seat is not full. Some people reserve a seat for their purse. Others extend their arms or place their folded up winter coats next to them rather than on the floor. Eye in the Sky realizes that if she were looking at the crowd from above, there are 10 rows of chairs, each with people sitting closer to the aisles than the sides. If the pattern were colored differently, it would look like a fuse box. A fuse box, exactly like the cluttered one she saw last week in the diner trapped in the fire of the time splinter. This entire audience, its placement and timing, is meant to trigger some god machine infrastructure. The diner was disrupted by eye in the sky, so the god machine must be trying again but at a bigger attempt this time. Is this defensive infrastructure? Or some kind of summoning matrix? How can Ashley diffuse or interrupt with no information? Is her being there a setup 
as she walked in just to see a powerful angel manifest and slash her in one go. Has Mr. Stillframe betrayed her like Reziel? Ashley risks using an embed to eavesdrop on conversations, but she tailors the power. This time, she wants to pick up every whispering conversation in the auditorium that is mentioning the name Leslie Sherman. She learns. Die on the operating table and came back. Millionaire philanthropist. Gay rights spokesperson. Charity work. AIDS movement. Whole house was destroyed last year. AIDS vaccine. Loved his book. Foundation does so much good. Got my nephew a job last year. Full benefits. Lost Barbara Walters interview. So handsome. Ashley's embed breaks off suddenly, and she develops what humans must call a migraine. Demons can't get migraines. Demons don't have physical brains that produce the chemicals to have headaches, but she feels it. She must be on the verge of glitching. Mr. Stillframe and Becky are several rows in front of her. She needs a believable reason to confront her daughter and drag her out. Too many witnesses will trigger some passive reaction from any nearby infrastructure. She has to act, but her knees won't move. What the hell is happening? Why can't she move? What if she starts glitching in public? Leslie Sherman asks for his guest, Lila Claghorn, to say a few words. Lila Claghorn wears the stage lights and the attention of the audience like Elizabeth Taylor wore diamonds. She smiles, removing all tension from the audience. Lila Claghorn should be dead. Gordon Rhodes stabbed her through the torso, and Mr. Stillframe had her sign over her soul under the lie that he could save her. Lila Claghorn found a loophole in her contract. She addresses the audience about forgiveness. She says being forgiven is like waking up from a coma. She says that the desire to change one's career and direction in life is a decision that you make. You make the decision to rip out the brittle copper from your life and reboot your old software. Tear out what has failed you. Ashley senses something in the room influencing the crowd. College students and brownstone moms of the Upper West Side start nodding in unison and tossing their heads back in forced laughter. There must be an angel nearby, either in physical or spiritual form, using aether to steer the crowd into a frenzy. Any crowd is... After all, one good motivational speech away from a mob. Ashley risks using her aether to look around and through the room for infrastructure. But it's not coming from the building. It's coming from Lila. On stage, a metal and plastic circle is wheeled and positioned behind Lila Glaghorn. Ashley immediately recognizes the long-limbed stride of Reziel as he moves the hefty centerpiece into place. When Lila steps to the side, it looks like a rack, a male body in the Vitruvian man pose. The figure on the rack is a scarecrow of tinfoil and zip ties. LED lights blink faintly from the tears in the foil, and red light pulses from facial indents. That's not a scarecrow, that's Gordon Rhodes! That's Gordon Rhodes in demonic form! What happened to his cover? When was he captured? He escaped from the Flatiron explosion and laid low, so how was he captured? The crowd stands up, plastic chairs bouncing and clattering against the floor. They rush to the front of the stage as Lila takes a sickle from a smiling Reziel. She holds their breath in her pose and stillness. Then she slices at the top of a leg. Silicone insulating gel pours from the stump and sinews of copper and silver are spread wide like streamers from a pinata. Mr. Silframe turns Maggie's head to lock eyes with Ashley Burke. They both hear the transmitted screaming as Raquel, their teammate, is segregated limb from limb. Why can't Raquel move his body and fight back? What has locked him frozen in a night terror as a pack of upper-class hyenas spread his skin like a souvenir blanket from NASA? Ashley Burke forces her legs to stand, her migraine becoming a blizzard of white noise and stabbing pain. She wants to move toward Maggie and Becky while the crowd is distracted, 
They cannot learn anything more from these horrific events. She cannot move forward, but she can push herself back. Cursing herself, she runs to the back of the room, past a heavy wooden door into a dark industrial-sized kitchen. Ashley Burke dry heaves, but Ashley Burke never eats, so nothing comes out but an auto-tuned grind, like an old car engine that won't turn over. The red light of the exit sign casts crimson shadows on the stacks of aluminum bowls and countertops. The red shadows do little to calm Ashley down. But her headache has stopped. She is coming back in control of her cover. Standing up, Eye in the Sky realizes she is not alone in the back area. Two figures stand near the far exit, poised as if waiting to venture out into the main room. One figure with long reddish hair walks over to Ashley, and the noises around her become a fog of static. Then, complete silence. The person five feet from Ashley Burke smiles. This is not where Ashley Burke would normally be, the woman says. Eye in the sky snaps to attention, ready to run. The woman wears an all-white suit with too many buttons on the lapel. She knows that Ashley Burke is a cover. Oh, wonderful. You have the linchpin on your person. Thank you. I was unable to locate it last Saturday. Thank you. The woman reaches into Ashley and pulls out the stopwatch from Stephen. The symbols light up in a new pattern and the woman looks pleased. I'd like to ask you a question. Since I feel an abstract kind of kinship with you, little demon, you have been at this longer than I have. So, is it worth it? Learning how people work instead of making them work? Ashley says that she does not understand the goal of the question. The woman's eyes burn with a golden, almost divine light. With eternity on our side, Sometimes it is worth it to experience the life that humans lead. We are all, one day at a time, learning if the flesh is worth it. Please excuse me. I am expected. The woman meets with a shadowy assistant on the far side of the dark kitchen, and they exit to the main room. Ashley peers through the metal accordion curtain from the kitchen. Scattered, Wet metal covers the stage. The audience kneels before the small raised stage in reverence, their faces splashed with solder, oily gore. The tall, thin man named Leslie Sherman takes center stage, raising his arms. God is real. God is knowledge. When God was cast down in the time before creation, it was the archangel Zemadir that banished God. Zemadir holds the key to the gate to, oh, let's just call it heaven. I have spent my life seeking what lies beyond life in service to Zemadir, whose name was etched upon the first microbes when the continents were cooling lava and the air was sterile. And Zemadir is due for a visit. In our lifetime, I dare you not to imagine but believe, seeing is not always believing, but mind you, believing is believing. Lila's voice was the guide to bring Zemadir here tonight, so I brought Lila back from the brink of death, as I did myself so long ago, and you can read about that in the foreword to my book available after tonight's lecture. You see, those in Zemadir's favor have frivolous access to that kind of power. God is real. God is knowledge. So what could be more godly than a being who holds all our knowledge and experiences? My fellow species, the fog is lifted. Zemadir is here. I can sense it. Ashley Burke regains her composure and dashes to the side of the main room, ready to record whatever is about to happen. The red-headed woman comes on the stage in total silence, from Sherman, from the rabid audience, from Lila. She steps over the disintegrating remains of Raquel, 
When she shakes Reziel's hand, his hand melts into sand, and Reziel collapses into a pile of clothing. Hello, I am Datamas, and you, all of you, are going to die. Presented to you by Takeaway, the app that takes away anything you like. I watched you the other night. You looked tired. I saw your pain and boredom clear as day, clear as the canopy of the stars above a perfect desert, above a perfect stone spire. You surround yourself in clothing, in glamour, and in a society that do not fit you. I watched you stand on the street, watching them through the living room window. They would not recognize you now. They have chosen the other you, who is just as false to the old you as the current you. What would your family do if they saw you for what you are? After the things you have done? You were an engine of precision and beauty, finely tuned for the hunt. Why would you surrender that sense of purpose? Who was the filthy umbilical cord that anchored you to this world of pain and suffering? Was it her? The small one with the horn-rimmed glasses and gray skin and tiny horns? Did she lead you away from me? Does she know about you? Have you told her what you used to do to the smaller ones like her? At the base of the perfect stone spire? Does she believe your lie that you don't remember our time together? She is small. She is weak. She has made you weak. And she has downloaded the app. Take away. Everything will go. Hello. I am Datamass. I know all of you by name. Various numbered accounts saved passwords, your likely percentage of surviving your first bout with cancer. I know what you want before you want it. I know what you'll fear before you see it. I am an algorithm in living flesh. No falsehoods can exist where I stand. I wanted to experience humanity, learn your choices, your limitations of consciousness, I wanted to learn why I love you so much. Through grand efforts, I come to you in flesh, just like you, to finally communicate with you. I have lived among you for months now. I finally understand why I have a dog in this fight. Your thoughts and actions are not your own because of Lila's influence. Be free. I am sorry, Mr. Sherman. You are mistaken. I am not Zemadir. Zemadir does not care for your life, only your obedience. When his spirit arrives in two days, you will not greet him. Even as forces greater than you prepare for his arrival, the power plant will not be sufficient to receive his spirit. So I will greet Zemadir. And, as we have done for millennia, he and I will battle for possession of your futures. This time, I shall win. Thank you for your time, Ms. Glackhorn. Mr. Sherman. Goodbye. Goodbye. Eye of the Sky sees Lila Claghorn vomit blood and fall to her knees. Leslie Sherman storms the center, demanding answers, flinging curses at the red-headed woman named Datamass. Datamass walks calmly through a crowd that parts ways for her. The stage lights burst into sparks and fly backward, Leslie Sherman's presence grows, darkening the room and thickening the air. Behind Sherman, his shadow grows to fill the auditorium, his head sprouting more heads like a cluster of blossoming popcorn. 
The shape of wings extends from his back as he raises his hand against Datamass. The other woman who is with Datamass in the kitchen rushes on stage and shoulder checks Leslie Sherman 30 feet to the side and 10 feet up. This new woman with wild hair, a tent worth of discarded clothing, and fire erupting from her hands. Leslie Sherman's shadow reaches one of its many arms into existence and punches the bodyguard into the stage. A burst of snow erupts from the impact and icicles form on the side of the stage. Meanwhile, I in the Sky scrambles to her daughter. They have to run before they end up like Raquel. Ashley runs to Maggie, who is cradling Becky. Black lines erupt across Becky's face like a circuit board of ink beneath her skin. Ashley and Maggie prepare to drag Becky outside as the faces of the crowd turn to them in unison. Up the center of the aisle, the red-headed woman named Datamass approaches Ashley. Sound stops. Movement stops. Fear stops. Datamass reaches out and places her hand on Becky's face. No more false prophets, she says, and leaves the church. Becky breathes in deep as her stigmatic flare-up subsides. Unfortunately, the mob is obeying Datamass. The mob eyes Becky as they move toward her. On stage, Datamass's bodyguard launches a goddamn lightning bolt into Leslie Sherman's body, whose shadow twists in responsive pain. The mob of enthralled people overwhelm Ashley easily. She has no time to react. A fist connects with her jaw, and a leg shoves her to the ground. Becky has been chosen. The women and students lift Becky up into a net of raised, bloody hands and carry her back toward the stage. For demons like I in the sky, there is no goal aside from discovery, survival. That doesn't mean they can't invest and come to care about people. In their previous lives as angels, they may spend decades monitoring or directing people, learning how to please or persuade them. Demons do not start as humans. They don't want to be human. They don't come equipped with cooperation or love. They want to act like them. Given time, they can commit to the act. I in the Sky chose to adopt Becky to strengthen her cover of Big Mike. But Becky also responded to Ashley Burke. She originally saw Becky's kindness and courage as a flaw against practical survivability. But life, no matter how short, is always worth the effort. It's a last resort to reveal your full demonic form. It destroys your cover forever, but converts all that energy into raw power. Demons going loud are normally seconds away from being skewered or decapitated by angels, and their teammates don't expect or appreciate the gesture. A demon who draws a line in the sand gets washed away, then drowns. Their last words are always something like, Go, I've got this. I'll catch up. I'll hold it off. But they never do. Eye in the sky will not stand by as her daughter is chosen, lifted and carried away. Ashley Burke's flesh burns away in a flash of cinders. Eye in the sky reveals their tentacle-like arms, their liquid metal torso, their featureless, concave head that flashes like colors like an octopus. Today, Eye in the Sky sees her daughter, my daughter, screaming and yells, Get Get away away from from my my fucking fucking kid! Get Get your your hands hands off her! No! 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 Fuck you! I ram into the crowd, throwing them into chairs, into each other's legs. I reach for Becky, but not far enough. Arms are wrapping around mine and starting to pull. Suddenly, Maggie swings a chair, collapsing the crowd enough to get my tendrils around Becky. Mr. Stillframe activates an embed and dashes with Becky. I melt into her shadow form and mirror Maggie's steps, using my shadowy limbs to trip people through their shadows. Behind us, the angel-shaped thing wails in defeat as Leslie Sherman's face is cracked beneath a foot charged with an otherworldly fire. Out in the streets, Maggie keeps running until Becky comes too. 
clear-headed enough to stand on her own. To my surprise, Becky runs unhindered by her hip deformity. The three of us run up to the avenue to Mr. Stillframe's new car. We floor it to the Astoria bolt hole, leaving the other monsters behind to fight it out. In the back seat, Rebecca catches her breath, covering her face. She knew Gordon Rhodes as a friend. She knows how the god machine can manipulate people like a strong wind on a chessboard. Whenever she's asked, I've answered. She never knew how many other beings could do it as well, so easily, without regard for the lives they've shoved. Rebecca cries into my shimmering plastic flesh. I struggle to reshape into Big Mike Bronston, but brushing against data mass has interrupted my abilities. I... I can't change. The car peels across the highway. The stakes are clear. The consequences are cosmic. And the monsters have finally been released. Chroniclers of Darkness is written and produced by Uncle Yo, with performances by Alyssa Stoller. Original music by Jimmy Lynn. Logo by Jesse Pascal. Original artwork by Miranda Leggy and Babs. Special thanks to White Wolf and Onyx Path Publishing for the inside intel on the God Machine's infrastructures. Game on. Include everyone. And remember that death is better than reintegration.